This morning session, uh, as I understand it, uh, is uh, meant to address how we create the conditions for what we call the New York City Channel for LIGO sources. Uh, it's New York City Channel because of the number of people who are New York or were in New York who wrote papers recently uh, of the stellar mass black hole binary in the disk of an uh, active nucleus. So, in, in the context of the day, today and tomorrow, I think there are uh, essentially uh, four questions we could discuss here, uh, which are listed here. So I'm going to go through this. And then I think we should start with the one-sliders and then have a discussion of all these issues. So uh, <clears throat> I just quickly listed these topics. Uh, so first, the first obvious question is uh, the abundance of suitable AGN disks where we could either form stellar mass compact remnant binaries uh, or capture them. Uh, so what disks are suitable for this, I think is not completely obvious. This have different densities, other parameters, sizes. They might be clumpy. They might not be in equilibrium. Uh, and so we want to first, I think, discuss what kind of disk we can use and how many of those there are per unit volume in the universe, uh, different redshifts. I should say I don't have answers. I only have questions. Uh, or rather, I have answers, but they may not be correct. Uh, so that's question one of the four. The second is, uh, well, there's basically the two ways. We, we said we can have compact binaries in this disk. One is to form them there. The other is to capture them there. So in terms of formation, uh, I think we want to discuss star formation in AGM disks. Where does it occur? Uh, in the outer parts, inner parts, what is the IMF? There are ideas that the stars are potentially massive, which is good for making uh, compact objects. Uh, what fraction of these are in binaries? Do we just say most of them? Because, because uh, most massive stars are in binaries in the general ISM. Uh, we want to know maybe other parameters. What are the mass ratios? What are the separation when they're born? Again, I have no answers. But I just wrote what I think are the most important questions. The third is if you create these binaries by capturing uh, either the stars from the three-dimensional bulge or already existing binaries from the bulge, then you want to know what is the 3D distribution of these stars and compact objects in the bulge. Uh, I'm not sure, that maybe the, I missed yesterday, maybe that was part of yesterday. But that should clearly be an important question. And then how efficiently the orbits of these stars and these binaries are dragged down into the plane. And then what happens when they're dragged down? I mean, binaries, you could worry they're disrupted. Uh, uh, you could ask where, at what radius or is this capture most efficient? In inner parts, outer parts of the disk, do you change the orbits? Do you make them eccentric, etc.? So that's about the, dra uh, the dragging down into the disk. And then the last uh, question, which is the negative negative aspect. I actually think we should discuss show showstoppers, in particular, uh, instead of forming forming stars in the disk. Is it possible that we lose many of them due to scattering, for example? Uh, so uh, that's one, one potential showstopper. There might be others. Another obvious one is that you might uh, accrete a lot by these compact objects, emit a lot of radiation, and disturb the disk, which will change the whole paradigm, maybe make it more difficult to merge binaries in the disk. So uh, I guess this number four is sort of caveats. So that was my four questions. Uh, I should say that there are two more sessions. So just to flash the program up. So I think there are two obvious questions after this. So once you set the stage and create these binaries in the disk, then we want to discuss do these binaries actually merge? Uh, and do they migrate through the disk? So what happens afterwards? And I think as far as I understood the program, that's this afternoon. Do you agree? I agree. Uh, so that's what happens to the binaries. 
And then tomorrow there will be a session on also to the single stars and binaries and binary formation in the disk. <clears throat> And then the third aspect of this, which will be tomorrow's, is how do, tomorrow's topic is how do we diagnose this process in observations. So that, that will be the focus, I think, tomorrow. So this will be read by Mordecai. I forgot who's. Is it? The, 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 Jillian. Jillian is not here, so she agrees. <laughs> by default. Um, so I should say I, I, I haven't directly worked on most of these topics. So it, it's going to be a very boring discussion unless people uh, start chiming in. Uh, but I think we should start before we do anything else. So I got slides from a few people. Uh, hi. You can quickly read the. Uh, you can quickly read the, the people who came in just now. You can quickly read the plan. Uh, and then I think we have a few slides. Show you. So these are the individuals who sent slides. Yuri Levin, Seda Nasim, Savik, Jose Adorno, Barry, and Andrea. So I think we should first of all go through these slides. I tried to uh, see if I can somehow talk about these slides, but most of them I couldn't. So I, I just have to ask the people to, to discuss their slides. So that's the plan. We start with the slides, and then we hopefully discuss these four topics. If you have objections, you should mention them now. Yes? My partner should be like zooming in, so I do like to present remotely for another couple minutes regarding, like we're sharing our slides, so. Oh, right, that's, that's Andrea? Oh. Oh, uh, her name is Gaia. OK. Yeah, she's on the Zoom now. OK, great. I don't know if she's already. Do you want to start? Actually, I have these slides in order here. This is Andrea on the Zoom. Amy? Uh, I don't see Andrea. Okay, then we'll have to skip her slide. I, do you know if she was planning to come morning or afternoon? We're skipping can, Andrea's. Oh, I can, do you I, want can, to... I can talk about it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, how about this? How about Hiromichi? You want to go explain your slides? Take the mic. <laughs> so my slide is uh, not uh, new results, but uh, just my uh, curiosity. Uh, so my question is uh, uh, how how in homogeneous the star forming region of Asian disk is. And also, uh, there's a gap open due to the feedbacks by Black Rose and Massive Stars. Uh, for example, feedbacks are supernovae, uh, radiation, wind, jet, and dynamical interaction. <coughs> and uh, as far as I know, uh, the, the simulation about the uh, star formation in Asian disk doesn't consider the uh, feedbacks. And uh, I think the uh, most famous simulation is by uh, uh, Nayak Sin et al. And uh, they performed the uh, SPH simulations. And uh, there is a snapshot and uh, red plot uh, formed the stars. And Haraz shows uh, density profile. And they find that the formed star is uh, uh, very top heavy. And uh, also, they find that uh, after the formation of new stars, the star is thickened by the dynamical interaction to uh, newly formed stars. Uh, but uh, my question is. Uh, is it changed uh, by considering the various uh, feedbacks? So yeah, that, this is just my question. And if you have some questions, it's yeah, good to discuss. Yeah, Mordecai, you want to add something? 
I think I'm adding a further question, which is how close is the um, star forming region to the region with migration traps, which is uh, a few hundred RG. So I, these star forming, this model looks like, looks like its inner edge is the outer edge of our region of interest. Um, but I'm going to pass this on to whoever can discuss those numbers. I don't, I, I don't remember the exact uh, numbers, but. Um, yeah. I mean. Oh. I mean, yeah, as a, as a general rule, I think the, the, the idea is that right with AGN disks, the inner parts are gravitationally un, are stable, and, and, and the, then the outer parts are where you get these instabilities that may give rise to in situ star formation. And I think, I think the transition is at, you know, tenth of a parsec or parsec or something, depending on mass of the black hole, accretion rate, et cetera. Um, so you could imagine, yeah, I mean, so forming stars in this outer region, and then I don't know if they can migrate into the inner parts or feed the disk. Um, they, can def they can definitely migrate in, um, but they, the gaps and lumps uh, will probably just influence that migration somewhat. They quit jitter in the migration, most likely. Uh, I wouldn't see so clear that they certainly migrate in. I'm not sure it's also so many stars that it's not saying it's Let's right. Let's get the mic. Oh, you a lot of exercise. <laughs> so, oh, we didn't tell you you were going to jog around today? <laughs> anyway, I think we should be a bit more careful about it. Presume that the migration is efficient. I would say that it might not be efficient at all. I mean, the disk is pretty well wide at this region. This is 0.3.5 parsec. Even with the age of this is a pretty big disk. It's not a very regular, let's say, planet migration like thing. So quick question, actually. I, actually, I just wanted to um, point out that um, by the analogy with MRI-driven turbulence uh, in the protoplanetary case is that for uh, the lumps and bumps of the MRI-driven turbulence drive random walks of objects that are in, uh, with uh, mass ratios smaller than about 10 to the minus 7. Um, so single stars may well be in the random walk regime just diffusing around in the disk due to these lumps. Um, bigger objects may still be able to migrate, but you're absolutely right that once you get inhomogeneous, as uh, you're, you're showing, um, that that may cause diffusion rather than directed migration, which will still diffuse some stars inwards. Uh, I have my own mic. Um, yeah, but needs to go to um, Next yeah, I, uh, is it, I actually want to say something because I wonder what, do, so do we care about the migration? Why do we actually care about the migration? In the sense that if you want to create a LIGO source, if all these stars are born in binaries and merge, then you're not relying on migration to create an event. So there you go. I elicited some hands. So if you have O stars that are being driven together. I mean, basically, I think that there's some chance that the gas density is high enough in the star formation regions that if you just form an O star binary, that it may not turn into a black hole before they get jammed together by the, uh, by the gas interaction. Um, and so you don't get a LIGO source. two things. Observationally, we can actually try to use the galactic center observation. We do have observations of whole stars and binaries in the disk. So in principle, right now, the observation is very limited. We have about two or three of those, which are actually consistent with the high binary fraction, but that's nothing more than that. In principle, the future might be seeing uh, more lower mass uh, companions. We can actually check some of these possibilities. On a different aspect, the migration puts heat into the disk, which means that it changes its properties. So we do care about the migration, just even to understand the disk evolution, how it affects the binary mergers, too. So we do have to care about it all the time. Okay. Can I just find one yeah. more comment? Yeah. The other thing is, 
uh, like I said yesterday, this or galactic nuclei are quiescent for longer than they are active. And so unless the star formation rate is stupendously high during the active phase and stupendously low during the quiescent phase, it seems likely that there will be more black holes formed during the quiescent phase, and therefore you have to worry about things like disk capture. So, just numbers. Uh, okay, let's go to uh, Vlad. Um, uh, a question about the model there. I, I am trying to, to, uh, to understand what I am uh, uh, looking at. So the disk seems to be uh, uh, less dense near the, the inner boundary, right? Why is that? Well, I guess it's because it's just top walls, so less density. It is just, uh, I think, uh, due to the formation of stars and uh, there is no replenishment of gas, mm -hmm. so gas density decreases. Right, yeah. So the gas that was used to 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 form the stars. The other question is the uh, the lower plots, right? It seems that the x-axis is a small part of the uh, the upper plots. I mean, the uh, the upper plots go from minus four to four, and the inner plots go from minus three to, to well, from uh, from minus O three to to O three. And that part, if you see there in the uh, the upper plots, there there is nothing. In, right? So can you uh, explain? Uh, oh, what you just the, the edge, edge on. on. Yeah, it's edge on, so you cannot see the, the central cavity. Just edge on. Ah, right? you you don't see it. Okay, fine, fine. And it won't, and the resolution is so we'll be able to see the. The but related to this, are we worried that this, this is, I assume, just time steps, so the disk thickened no. over time? Mm -hmm. sure. So uh, are we worried about that in the sense of making it harder for stars to, to, um, uh, to scatter on each other and form binaries? And, Yeah, sorry. I just had a quick comment about why um, we care about migration. Uh, we talked yesterday about how uh, the AGN is promising for hierarchical uh, binary formation. So uh, sure, they form in a binary. Maybe that binary merges. But if we want a, a second uh, merger, then, then that's why we care about migration. So. Uh, Brian, you want to say something? There, there have been, of course, analytic works that have attempted to account for feedback. And the usual story one does is one waves one hands and say that nature finds a way to regulate the tumor IQ to unity. Uh, and anything that, that, you know, I need, I make as many stars as I need to achieve that regulation. Uh, and I think the question then is the details of what is the feedback when you start forming stars? Is it the accretion onto? The black holes that form? Is it the migration of these black holes? Is it the, the, the radiation pressure, uh, winds, etc.? Um, but I think that you know there is probably analytic directions one can can approach this. Uh, I mean, there have been attempts as this, this Thompson paper I'm familiar with, which tries to use radiation pressure as the feedback. But there may be ways to generalize this to to make analytic models. Uh, uh, so I think there's definitely more work that could be done. Um, and, and I guess the goal is, I mean, I think one of the things is to figure out how much of the gas you, you, you plop down goes into stars and how much actually gets into the, to the inner parts. Uh, but this is a broader problem than what we're dealing with here. So the thing, I, I guess the picture I have from that is that the Thompson paper, it's, uh, it's describes an average, locally average uh, scenario where the heating rate is, is just distributed throughout the disk. Whereas uh, I guess one could say the worry is that you have a you have a much stronger feedback near the binary itself, which is where you want the gas to be there to drive the binary to coalesce. So this microscopic uh, environment of the binary could be affected in a way that's just not addressed in these kind of 
steady state uh, coarse grain Thomson model. So that's, I guess, what I had in mind. Well, I don't know what you had in mind, but when I wrote in my bullet radiated feedback, that's what I had in mind. But maybe you can develop this a little more. According to uh, Tom Stentor, uh, I, I, I think they said that uh, supernovae and the radiation comparably, almost comparably. Right, but yeah, I think, I think Zoltan, yeah, Zoltan's saying if, if you want to know the, 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 ga the gas in the immediate environment, let's say we're trying to figure out what is the, the gas density that's a, you know, driving the binary together, that, that, that may be different than what it is in an average, you know, and I suspect this also relates to, to uh, the question about, or the issue of, of the, of w when they're O stars themselves, does that, you know, what is the feedback from two O stars on the environment versus the feedback from two black holes that are accreting? <laughs> uh, sort of leave this picture, maybe O stars feedback is more isotropic and black holes shoot out their jets in one direction. And, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to inject something from perhaps just my ignorance, but observationally, a lot of people have looked for a very long time. There's been no connection set between Seifert activity and star formation. People have looked for that for a very long time. And particularly if you have O stars forming, then you have to have supernova. And su so Seiferts and AGN should be sites of excess supernova, but that has yet to be shown, although some more recently of these larger monitoring have shown supernova at the centers of AGN, but it's not an excess up to the level. So I'm wondering, what is the level of star formation that this is happening at? So, so is that true that for quasar, I mean, I, my impression was for luminous quasars, there is evidence for starbursts occurring at uh, the nuclei of a quasar. But in, in Eulergs, but not uh, just in quasars, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah this, this will be great to clarify, actually. So, I mean, there's many types of AGN, and so I think going to your first slide of, you know, what is, or, you know, what, what type of AGN matters, right? So for Seiferts, they have pretty, you know, big, massive, dense disks. They probably matter for the dynamics of the stars within them, and they vastly outnumber quasars. Um, so I would say that what they're doing does, uh, does matter and certainly in terms of rates might matter more than quasars because they're relatively rare. But um, on the other hand, um, I think that it's possible to bury uh, supernova. I mean, it is possible to bury supernova in a sufficiently dense disk. And so if <laughs> things are at the mid-plane of a sufficiently dense disk, it's not obvious to me that you will see the supernova or anything that looks super strange. So, so should we work? I mean, that, that's yeah. another reason I was wondering about this. Uh, they don't seem to be in the mid-plane. Does anybody know this simulation and where we believe that particular aspect, that the stars seem to be diluted in a vertical direction? I don't know. Well, yeah, because I would have expected them. Not to. a surprising thing, right? Yeah. With jitter. Yeah. This is expected. This is just so relaxation. And uh, you need to remember that initially the disk is extremely dense if you, you can actually see it. So the relaxation times are extremely small, and they immediately you have the diffusion of stars to in contrast, and they you know, give, a, give a rise to this uh, increased height. And you need to remember in these simulations, we don't have really well, the resolution of near the stars, even if this is a global simulation. It's really difficult to get the you know, diameter friction or the migration very, really right in this kind of case. So. so we're having great discussion. This is one slide, and there are 30 minutes. So I think maybe we should try to go to another slide. Is anybody feel that his, their slide is particularly should follow this? Otherwise, I'm going to pick a random uh, next one. Yeah, I suspect you. Yeah. Your yeah. Okay. Uh. Yep. Yep. There we go. 
Yeah, so I'll. Um... <laughs> we have a figure, right? I have a, yeah, no, I have an but, animation. So if I like hit it, okay. project it, then I'll, then I can make it do it. Oh, what just happened? Oh, there we go. Okay. So if I click the animation. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to make a, a small point here. Uh, well, two, but. Um, that you know, sometimes we might worry we don't really know where the AGM disk gas comes from, uh, or how galaxies that are quiescent turn into AGM. But I think that for uh, dynamical purposes, we don't care um, because the total mass that's going to be added to the nucleus is small. So conservation of angular momentum says that. Uh, the orbits will be slightly perturbed, but you're not going to change anything dramatic, right? If you have a 1% addition to the central mass, I, I don't care. Um, <clears throat> if there's some something stable, it might go unstable, but there's lots of things that will go unstable it's in this picture. It's, yeah, small compared to the central mass, the, the central massive black hole. Right, the mass of the disk is not large. So if you're worried about the orbits moving in because you've increased the central mass, you've only increased it by like 1%. So, um, and uh, right, so that's one piece of it. Uh, but then there's uh, this, which is uh, some observational evidence. So I think Chelsea talked on Monday about the time scale of variation in AGN disks and what that can tell us about their properties. And this is a plot from a forthcoming paper. Um, it's nearly submitted. Uh, and it's just showing um, for changing state quasars, we see changes, large changes in the continuum luminosity on time scales of order a year. And and if you assume that those uh, changes are happening at 50 RG or 150 RG, um, you can um, say what the aspect ratio and the alpha you need is. You, you can't constrain them independently, but they are constrained to lie along a line. Um, if you assume that it's some kind of sound crossing or front time scale, uh, you get these kinds of values. If you assume that it's actually due to viscous time scale, you get these kinds of values. And so, um, you know, for in order to get time scale changes that are large, um, in, in order to get luminosity changes that are large on one year time scales, you have to have relatively large H over R um, and modest alpha. So, at least for these changing state quasars, we can say that their disks are pretty fat. Can you say what these changing state quasars are just for the Oh like yeah, Lehman? sure. Yeah, sorry. Like me. Sorry, OK. So um, there are quasars that change their continuum luminosity. I, I mean, they're basically observationally defined just in some sense. Uh, quasars that change their luminosity um, in the blue by a couple of magnitudes in, you know, years, like two years, and then, or sometimes even less. There's one example uh, Guo published that drops and then bounces back in over four or six months. So these are very fast time scale changes um, for a very large system. And initially, people suspected that they might be absorption caused, but there's a lot of new work showing that in in most cases, that's not really a very plot. Like it's 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 much harder to fit the luminosity changes and the spectral changes. We also see, for example, things like changing shape of the H beta line. So we know like the velocity field is changing. Something something is substantively changing. Um, it's different from what Charlie said. The change changing look. No, yeah. Chelsea's got some. Yeah, so so sorry. Yeah, I think um, because originally they were identified observationally, and there was you know the sim well the least controversial uh, explanation was that there was some absorber coming in and messing up our observations. Then you would say they're just a changing look. 
plays are, but now I think people are, are th starting to realize, no, they're definitely not, it's not our point of view that is the problem. It is something that is happening in the innermost disk. And, um, you know, you see time lags in other, uh, in particular in the infrared. So um, <clears throat> I'm on a paper with uh, Nick Ross that shows that the, uh, that there's an infrared lag, which is what you'd expect if there's something in the innermost disk changing and then with a you know light time travel lag dropping the infrared um, a few years later. So that's the kind of thing that we're seeing more of and people are, I think, starting to say, okay, that's a change of state, not just a change of the look of it. Okay, two questions, just to make sure I get your point here, is that from this short time scale, you conclude that the disk has to be quite dense. Is that your main point? Uh, uh, not dense, tall. So H over R, thick. scale height, thick. thick. Yeah, geometrically <laughs> thick. So you need something to change the scale height of the disk. Huh? You do need something to change the scale height of the disk that is, but not, sorry, so we're seeing these things, again, actually, they're not just dropping in luminosity, they often recover on similar time scales. So they, so they decrease their luminosity, then they increase their luminosity. So we think that the scale height probably is changing as part of that change. It's often asymmetric, but it's still overall, like the scale height should be some not razor thin number. You know, it's, it's gonna be in the range of you know, a few to ten percent is not a is not an unreasonable. And maybe these are special quasars. You know, so maybe they are. What's your cut but, on the magnitude change? Because quasars change even on much shorter time scales. Mm -hmm. So you could make arguments for having to do even shorter time scales. So they're very broadband changes. And Chelsea, you have like I'm I'm gonna throw to you for like a good selection criterion actually. Just that's her. <laughs> yeah, so quasar variability has always been a, sort of a mystery, right? Because uh, we see changes on shorter time scales than the viscous time scale for a thin disk. Um, now, then, with the discovery of these extreme large, extremely large changes for luminous quasars or changing state, or changing the quasar, same thing, um, we're even more confused. <laughs> so then we start asking these questions could it be? like a state change, um, it's something, could something physically be changing in the disk? Uh, so, uh, and, and I had a question for, for, the, for you for the plot. So are you, are you saying that if you assume a, t a viscous time scale and a time, an, a, a viscous time scale that is a year, equals a year, and yes. um, at this, these radii yes. for these alpha, then you would need a disk that thick Yes, for right. the for the time to match one year. Okay. Yes, that's oh. exactly what these constraints are. So if you if you want a time scale, the viscous time scale to be one year at 150 RG, then you need a stupidly large. You know, you need a you need H over R to be you know at least 0.2 or almost 0.2 at a minimum, and um, and that's for an alpha of like one. Right, so you need a you need a very large. You you can in principle do it. Just based, this is just a very simple time scale argument, right? But I don't think anybody wants to make the argument that this look like this. Okay. So let's not assume. Let's assume it's not the viscous time scale that's doing it, but let's assume that information is propagating on the sound speed time scale, which is this, and you still need a very fat disc or a pretty large alpha, right? So if you want to say alpha is 0.1. And you know your your best case scenario, right, is that this is happening um, at uh, 50 RG, and you've got an alpha of 0.1, then you need an H over R of 0 0.6, or 0 0.06, sorry. Um, or if you say, okay, I'm only talking H over R of 0.1, and you've got an alpha of 0.05, I think, 0.06, something like that. So it's really, you know, it's really hard to explain the fact that there's these large coherent changes that seem to be originating in the inner disk 
on short time scales. So it's not like, yeah. So, so another quick question. In analogy with the stellar, I guess, cataclysmic variables or the, the stellar case, yeah. uh, the time scale to drop the luminosity is faster because the disk is drained on the on the viscous time scale in the, the hot, thick disk phase, and then the recovery is slower. Yes, right. Is that same for quasars as well, that the yes. ramp up in luminosity is much slower than the drop in luminosity? Yes. Yes, I, I can think of several. Yeah, so like Ross et al. 2018 definitely looks like that, and that was one of our arguments, that there's like a sharp, there's a sharp drop and a slow recovery, a slower recovery. I've seen, I've seen the other way around. I've seen the other way around. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is very, thanks, very interesting. But uh, and then just, shall we connect this back to our question of the binaries in the AGN list? So, sure, I can. I, yeah. Well, no, just. I'll hand the microphone back. I just wanted to say one, uh, just give yeah. a, a advertiser meeting. So, yeah, um, we're having a meeting called Quasars in Crisis uh, at the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh uh, this August. Uh, so, yeah, it's also during the Fringe Festival. So, um, yeah, we're, we want observers and theorists to come and, and discuss. Um, with our accretion disks and in light of new observations. So I'll hand this back now. Talk to me if you're interested, or, or Savik and Barry are also going to be there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, what's the origin of viscosity in the disk? I mean, not very close to massive black hole, just lar no, wide, larger scale. We're showing this star formation in disk happening on scales of 3.1 parsecs. What kind of viscosity, if any, do we have there? The MRI, right? MRI, MRI from so what? Huh? From what? From magnetic fields. Yeah, but we don't. Why should we have? Magnetic should be no. Should be necessarily ionized or whatever or anything. Yeah. It is not ionized. These large distances, not necessarily. Uh, it's all hot. It should be okay. Ionized. Right. Yeah. Uh, if it's not heavily ionized, then we can go back into the protoplanetary <laughs> case and think about disk winds, which are apparently a pretty robust conclusion for partial, mostly neutral disks, um, and they still transfer angular momentum quite effectively. However, uh, if you actually have enough star formation to maintain Q equals one, not having at least you know a few tenths of a percent of ionization, which is or not even tenths, hundredths of a percent of ionization, which is all you actually need to keep the MRI uh, going. Uh, well, actually, you need every every neutral needs to hit an ion at least yeah, once in orbit. Where is the magnetic field coming from? The magnetic field is generated in the disk. The MRI is a self-sustaining <laughs> dynamo. <laughs> So all you need is a seed field, and then you get exponential growth. And if you have all these supernovae going on, then you're going to get a turbulent dynamo on top of that that will bring you up to you know, a percent of equipartition and allow the MRI to take hold strongly. Ryan, do you want to add something? I just wanted to say very briefly, which was yesterday, uh, in your talk, a lot of you said that, that the dust and all these horrible things and uh, partial ionization, we don't have to worry about in this context. But, and that's true on these small scales, but yes, on the larger parsec scales where we're getting the star formation, I think all of these horrible things come back to haunt us <laughs> in the AGN case as well. I mean, <coughs> then things got interesting. I mean you're, you're, you're in the region of the disk where you're worrying about uh, molecular opacities and uh, all types of horrible things. Okay, maybe let's move, let's move into the inner part of the disk. On that, exactly. Okay, and then afterwards we move to the inner part of the disk where it's <laughs> where it's safer. Safer. <laughs> Well, that's here. I'm going to move us to the inner part of the disk, which is so I'm going to like bang this drum all day. Uh, in our own galactic nucleus, there are you know the S stars are very close to the black hole. They are in what would be the thin part of any theorist's AGN accretion disk. They are not in that like Taurus region, right? There are things that are that are very close, that are hundreds, about, well, a thousand RG out, right? And we think that there are stellar mass black holes interior to that, so, and in large numbers. And so my, you know, one thing that I want to point out is, right, in the past in general, AGN disk theorists have sort of said, oh, well, we've got an AGN disk, and they've thought about it as a gas disk alone. But <clears throat> I think you know, it, it's almost certain 
in our own galactic nucleus that there are probably, a, you know, a thousand is not an unfair number to guess that there might be a thousand uh, objects close enough to be interacting with the innermost disk where we don't have to care about the dust and we don't have, you know, it's going to be hot if there's a disk in there. Okay, so let's move there. Uh, I see one slide who is talking about capture, capturing uh, uh, stars. This is um, so imagine you're in the Milky Way, uh, ten to the seven years ago. There was a nice little disk and lots of compact objects. Do you want to discuss? Yeah, when should come up? I think also Gaia will be doing the first part. Do you want to okay. come here? Uh, it's probably yeah. easier to hear. Gaia, are you uh, online? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, yes. awesome, awesome. Okay, so, um, yeah, I'm going to start and then Saida is going to uh, keep talking about the project with You're them. a little garbled. If you can get close to your mic, that might help. <laughs> you want the hot seat? Is it better now? Oh, wait. Good enough. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so in our project, what we care about is the interaction of a stellar object, which could be, which could be a star or a black hole, with the AGM disk itself. Now, if you say that can play the video so that we... Now, each time the star passes through the disk, The, the upper one. So each time the star passes through the disk, it is experiencing a movement, which is caused by the drag force. And so this drag force is making the star losing both kinetic energy and momentum, which is causing the star to run down into the disk. Now, our objective is to calculate how long it will take to grind down or to fall into the disk. This will depend, so at an initial inclination angle, at an initial distance from the uh, supermassive black hole. Now, for our project, we use two models, the Circo and Goodman and the thomson Quartet and Murray model. Now, this is, it's important to show that we're not assuming a flat disk, but we're assuming a disk with uh, some thickness is changing as a function of distance from the supermassive black hole. And also, um, the density of the disk is changing as a function of distance from the supermassive black hole. And since the drag force depends on density, and the, dr the drag force is what causes the star to grind down, the <coughs> density will play a major role in, the, in grinding down a star or object in general. Now, if you if you look at the graph on the, on the right, uh, you could see the drag force as a function of inclination angle, initial inclination angle, for a stellar mass black hole. Now, we know that the drag force depends on density of the disk, and the density of the density, and on the, let's say, radius of the star. And being the same black hole as the radius we use the Bundy radius, which is the effective gravitational radius that the black hole exerts on the disk. And we can see here that in, in this graph that the that the drag force is decreasing as the inclination angle. So it's this is the vertical component of the drag force. So it's decreasing as a function of initial inclination angle. This, so if in theory the, the inclination angle is um, increasing, the factor of the density is much greater than the inclination angle, so that the density is the major factor uh, of making the drag force decreasing. So when we will have less density, we will have less drag force. Now, uh, so the main part of our project was determining the grind time for, for different stellar objects. And we use several approaches, and now Saida will talk about the, the last approach we, we 
which seems to be the best one for stars. Um, thank you, Gaia. Um, I, I think maybe I should reiterate a couple of things because the sound was pretty, um, yeah, okay. Um, so essentially, Gaia was telling us about the two theoretical disk models that we were um, looking at for our studies on grind, grind time, the amount of time it takes for the orbit of an object to grind down into the plane of the disk. <clears throat> so the two models that we were looking at are the wait okay yeah all right the Thompson Quarter and Murray model um, indicated in red in both of these graphs and the Serco and Goodman model in blue. So up here, um, we are looking at the height profiles of the disks. Well, actually, like just this top right um, part is the height profile, and it ranges from like the same x-axis, like from ten to ten to the eight RG and the height ranges between 10 to the 11 and 10 to the 18 um, meters. Um, so this is just like an indicator of like the thickness. So that's, um, so we reflect it across both axes to like kind of give um, an idea of what like a cross section might look like from an edge on perspective. Um, and here are the density profiles of the disk of both disk models. So essentially, in both cases, in general, um, the disks are getting are thinner towards the center and denser. And as you move further away from the central supermassive black hole, uh, the height or the, the thickness increases, but the density drops off. Um, yeah. Um, we can see in the TQM model that there is a highly unphysical uh, jump um, around 10 to the 4 RG in the height as well as the density. So those are just some um, attributes of the theoretical models that we were looking at. And Actually, before you leave this plot, yes. I wanted to tell you, uh, there's a four or five orders of magnitude <coughs> difference in the density where yeah. So I think in the Thomson quarter, if I remember correctly, that's where you match to a smooth alpha disk. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And what's the difference in the circle Goodman? They just don't do that, or? Um, well, okay. So the way that so, these. So yeah. Sorry. What's the reason that circle Goodman is so much more dense? Well, these. Okay. But, sorry. Go ahead, Jeff. <coughs> um, so this. We were assuming that an AGM is in between these two models because the Zircon Goodman is much more accurate for uh, smaller media, and the Thomson Query Murray model is more accurate for uh, like a larger media. So it's um, so it's higher. It appears to be much higher because it's uh, we're assuming that it's more accurate for those range ranges of radii. Um, I don't think. Yeah, it was very hard to hear actually. Can you hear what you said? Um, so essentially what Guy is telling us is that at, like these disk models are derived from different uh, from different assumptions. So both of them, like for the Circle and Goodman model, we, not we, um, so for Goodman, um, created this model based off of data that we have from like the inner parts of the disk and then um, so it's more accurate for this like for these, like the inner radii and then like for the TQM model, the data that they used to make their model was from like the interstellar medium, like right outside of the disk. So it's more accurate for the outer parts of the disk. Um, so what we expect is that an actual AGN or actual AGNs will behave somewhere in between what these models show us because neither of them are perfect, um, but they, each of them have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, I hope that helps. Okay. Yeah. In general, the TQM model is just a little discontinuous, as you can, or, yeah, as you can see. All right. So, um, Gaia was telling us also about her drag force um, versus inclination plot. So, essentially, what we see here is 
uh, <coughs> the drag for the drag force exerted by gas flow on a stellar on a stellar mass black hole, where we where we assume that the that the SBH has a radius, um, has the Bondi radius as its effective radius, because obviously we can't just use like the event horizon because that's <laughs> not right. <laughs> so we so we're using the Bondi radius to act as the the effective surface area. Um, so the part like the surface area that would that would experience the drag force, much like the surface area of a star, because we are also looking at spectral objects, um, or stars. Um, yeah. So essentially, in this plot, we see the drag force as a function of the initial inclination angle of the orbit. So th if this is the plane of the disk, this would be the orbit. So this angle, like in between this and that, would be the and that would be the inclination. I'm sorry, that was very obvious. I don't know why. Okay. Anyway, so though that's what is on the x-axis, and here it's just for four different um, orbital radiuses, which are held uh, constant. So, yeah. Oh, okay. So Gaia did mention to me uh, that um, actually the 10 to the 3 RG in is higher than the 10 to the 4 RG. Like, they're almost in order, except this one, it, it's not. And basically, the reason, like, the reason this, the 10 to the 3 RG um, doesn't exactly act as you might have expected is because, like, it, it's not like it's, like, uniformly just increasing constantly as you go towards the disk. There are these, like, little, like, um, like bumps. Um, yeah, so there's that's, a greater density at 10 to the 4. So, yeah. so you're using the Circo Goodman in this plot? Yeah, All right. yes, actually, yes. yeah, I should um, mention both yeah, of these the are Circo and Goodman results. We only had one slide, so we had to, we had to, yeah. Okay, so there's that. Um, what this little animation was supposed to show was like for an incline, oh, okay. So essentially we have established that agent disks are not razor thin, so as beautiful as this little cartoon is, um, we were hoping to show like this little like donut lamp. It literally is a donut lamp from a donut shop, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's um, it it has a thickness, and like the blue arrows are supposed to indicate the parts of the orbit that are experiencing the drag force because it's not constantly feeling it and all that good stuff. Um, and this animation is just an indicator of, like, it's showing that every time it passes through the disk, it loses inclination, but also like a radial component. So the orbit is actually getting smaller, um, as well as less inclined, until eventually it is being ground down. And this process is the grinding down process, and the grind time is just how long it takes for that. Um, so this plot over here is um, grind time as a function of the orb the initial orbital radius um, for four different types of stars um, and an SBH and the dotted lines represent the lifetime of an EGN so anything that falls underneath that those dotted lines um, means that it grinds down you know while it matters and everything above it doesn't so um, the solid lines for all four spectral types, as well as the SBH, um, with the exception of the little horizontal ones, um, are results from a grind time function where we assumed a constant radius where, like, as you saw in this animation, the radius got smaller every time it passed through the disk. We, at first, we did not allow for that change. so. It was problematic in the sense that we didn't allow the conservation of energy in doing so. However, it allowed us to have like um, some preliminary results. And from those preliminary um, results, we see that um, until about 10, between 10 to the 3 and 4 RG, like anything in that range or less, like grinds down for all four spectral types. Um, for the Stellar mass black hole, 
um, it does not grind down for this inclination angle. Um, this graph also assumes an initial inclination of 45 degrees. Um, so I just want to mention in a graph not shown here, like if, like. Sorry, can I ask, uh, was it, are you using just the mass of these stars? No, the mass or as is well. Is there something else that mat matters here? The mass as well as their surface area. Um, so, okay, I should, okay. So essentially um, for this, the this four types of stars, they're somewhat listed in order of like density and surface area. So the M dwarf being the densest and like smallest versus the red giant being the biggest and least dense. So we see that like the denser and less like, like the smaller the object is, the more resistant it is to the drag force, hence the higher grind time. And in the case of the red giant, um, it being <coughs> so much larger and like less dense or diffuse compared to like the other star types, uh, diffuse is probably not the right word, but less dense compared to the other star types, it grinds down really fast. Um, you can picture the red giant being a beach ball on a windy day versus the end dwarf being a basketball. And if you throw it in the air, you know, the basketball will be less susceptible to that wind, but the beach ball will go flying to the ends of the earth <laughs> because, yeah. So, sorry, so by drag force, do you mean diameter of friction or do you mean some, this must be something else then? Cross sectional. This is the, just scooping up with a snow plow the, the momentum of the, <clears throat> the cylinder in the cross section. Except area. for the SVH where there's an approximation of dynamical friction. Right. Talk well, about what, you, what cross section you use for the SDH. Um, do we mean for the the Bondi? Yeah. Okay. So, for the for the stellar mass black hole, um, through all of these, both of these calculations, we assumed the Bondi radius. Um, for a long time, we struggled with whether the Bondi radius was the correct radius to assume for the stellar mass black hole. It was between this and the um, Hill sphere radius. Um, but ultimately, we decided for this part for these particular um, dynamics um, of just passing through the disk and experiencing drag force that the Bondi radius was the most effective effective radius. Yeah, also, the Bondi radius depends on the relative velocity. Yes. Um, well, also, that, that was really important to us. Like you know, looking at the um, velocity of the disk with respect to the stellar mass black hole, and that would would give us like a better understanding of the effective gravitational force that the stellar mass black hole has on the disk. Um, also, the, as Guy mentioned, that the Bondi radius has a dependency on the relative velocity, which in turn has a dependency on inclination angle. So as I was going to mention um, a few minutes ago, uh, if we looked at different inclinations, like initial inclinations. So this graph is for an initial inclination of 45 degrees. If we looked at inclinations that were like less, for example, 10 degrees, um, it wouldn't do anything for the stars. They would essentially have like the same like grind times. However, in the case of this, um, the stellar mass black hole, it would make a significant difference for the case of, uh, for the case of 10 degrees of inclination everything else like being the same, the stellar mass black hole would like, the plot would be like around like two times 10 to the uh, six, I believe um, between, yeah. Um, yeah, it would be somewhere in, it would come down significantly like where a portion of it would be ground down. And that was for, th this is all assuming a constant radius throughout grind time. Um, in newer calculations, we have uh, been allowing the change for um, the for the radius to change over the course of grind down, and that's what are indicated on in with the little stars, and the little hor horizontal extensions represents the uh, the change in radius. So the, where the star is is where the initial <coughs> orbital radius would be, and these like little points to the left of the stars would be like. The, the final orbital radius by the time it grinds down. So they, the orbital radius decrease, de, decreases by about half an order of magnitude. 
Um, and also we find that the change in grind time is also lessened by approximately an order of magnitude um, when allowing for this change. So we're optimistic. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, so uh, I wonder if Imra, you have a comment on right. this? Very interesting. So, so one comment is that uh, an extra parameter. Mike, Mike, uh, pass it down. I, 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 I used, I'm used to jogging now. <laughs> so one actual parameter you may want to take into account is uh, eccentricity uh, for the orbit, right? So uh, that actually, we find that that makes, makes a, a large difference when you have a more eccentric orbit. Um, so, so that will, that will change uh, some of these. I, when I asked if you have a comment, I thought something more serious. Because in, in our paper, basically, we found the, 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 the black holes also get drunk, got drunk, ground down uh, within the short time scale of the Adrian disk. So, so there must we find be for, uh, I mean, there is a distribution based on the, uh, the inclination angle as well. Uh, so for the uh, smaller inclination angles, the, the grind down time is, is very fast. So they're going to uh, be in within you know, a million years order. For larger inclinations, you just don't get ground down, essentially. So the distribution matters a lot. Um, how you know if you start a nice, with an isotropic distribution, then you're going to have a fraction of the black holes move in very quickly um, within the lifetime of the AGM. Actually, that's interesting. Um, the eccentricity of the, right now we're assuming uh, circular orbits, um, but eccentricity has been like on our like radar. Um, however, we have been prioritizing like things like the uh, allowing for the conservation of energy and, and things like that um, first, um, because when it comes to electricity, um, we assume that like, on average, the orbits will be circular. Does that make sense? It does, but it's, I don't think it's I think eccentricity yeah. matters it's because, it's a, because uh, you go much closer to the dense regions. And, and your relative velocity will be different, right? So it's a simplified uh, approach. Like we started with circular orbits, but the yes, the idea is with time to uh, include also like more elliptical orbits. But this is just like let's say a preliminary approach to grind time. Also, like these these results, like they're not definite yet. Like what we're doing now is what we are we are looking as, um, specifically at the. <coughs> stellar mass black hole, because we believe that it's not just the drag force that is playing a role here, but also the gravitational force that the stellar black hole is exerting. So, and we believe that that would also even decrease the grind time. So, uh, Brian, uh, Brian, you have a comment? Yes, using this so, so just so defending, I feel like I'm the defender of the outer messy parts of the accretion. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, maybe you could see that these lines are crossing at you know t around ten to the four, and that's you know that that bump in the Thompson model. That's where this you know this messy nasty stuff is starting. Uh, so I'm just so just as a general point, I mean, when you have if you inject black holes at small scales, they're gonna you know you're gonna establish this a call wolf like cusp or something, and and you know for. For all of these profiles, the mass and total mass in black holes is dominated by the larger radii. I mean, and the question is, can we get them together? But they're always, usually, as long as it, you know you have time to spread, there's always going to be more black holes on larger radii. So, so basically, we're, our total rate is going to be dominated by how far out we can go and get them to merge. So I'm and not actually well sure. I'm not actually sure we agree with that, right? In, in our paper, in our well, in red, in our, I was going to make the same comments, but I, wait, yeah, wait, 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 what do you mean? It doesn't matter at low uh, radii. What, what doesn't matter? The, the larger radii matter, so the difference is small radii. I don't think that will make a huge difference. Well, what, sorry, what, I mean, I'm missing the point. So you're saying you're saying that at small radii, sorry, most black holes will will move into the disk at larger radii. Yes, that's yeah, what I was that, saying. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, okay. Before, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. So, but you, you don't agree. I, I actually I, I, I don't agree uh, because I thought in our paper most of the captures happened. That's short radius, 0.01 parsec or so. But that's that's smaller than one, like one, 0.1, right? Uh, point, are we looking at our? 0.01, 0.01. That's, that's much less than 0.1 parsec, right? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, did you say short radius? No. Uh, yeah, so, 
let's make this clear because I think the question is actually kind, kind of important. Uh, are most of the captures in the smooth, stable part of the disk where we believe them more or whether they're in the messy outer part? I thought in our paper, <laughs> we find most of the captures around 0.01 parsec, which was in the stable, smooth part. Yes. So not, not in the... Not, that, it, that, okay. not in the gravitational so, that's, that's different than what this is saying. If I have a if I have a, a, a AGN that's around for a million years or, or ten million years, it looks from this that they should be capturing out to to, to you know. Well, it's actually hard to tell uh, from this plot because capture time is much shorter here, but there are fewer stars there. You have to multiply. With the number density of stars. This is showing that Brian down happens at smaller radii, uh, larger radii. So Brian's, well, point, I mean. Brian's point is there are more stars out here. I'm saying there's more stars out there, and so I'm saying if you pop, <coughs> pop down a disk and it lasts for ten to the seven years, you're going to grind down everything out to the radius where maybe I missed it. <laughs> so also the 45 degrees is not representative, right? You're going to have a distribution, and the smaller inclination will grind in by the the higher one would be, so it does not, doesn't matter where you are. 45 degrees, it's pretty rep, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's really distribution. There's a distribution, but it's, it's 45 degrees is a typical angle. I <laughs> 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 yeah. have to be convinced. Do we have to vote if 45 is typical or not? Afterwards. I just wanted to, to add uh, that, as Gaia mentioned, that we're like right now. These are just this. This is the effect of just drag force for um, for prograde orbits. Um, we've looked between like zero and like almost 90 degrees. Um, we haven't looked um, into, we have considered, we have looked into uh, retrograde orbits, but the, um, the struggle with that is that we also have to take into account the gravitational pull of the disk as well for retrograde orbits, because in the case of prograde orbits, the gravitational pull will pull it in the same direction as the, the drag force. So if anything, it, it will make the grind time faster. <coughs> However, in retrograde orbits, the gravitational radius will be pointing against the pull of the, the drag, sorry, the gravitational force will be pu pulling against the, the drag force because even if this, like for example, if this were a retrograde orbit, it would not just grind down like closer to the disk, it would flip over into prograde and then grind down if it were just based on the drag force. So we have to take into account um, other things when looking at retrograde orbits. I just wanted to add that. Um, as far as the 45 degree, I thought it was a good angle. I think we should just vote. Is it typical um, or not? I think it's angles. a good angle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, did you have something to add? Yeah, yeah. I, um, yeah, so I was just going to add that I think um, yeah, we can't extrapolate this directly to a rate of where it's going to be more important because, as you said, like this is just for an object. What is the grind down time from 45 degrees? And it's only for the drag force. And I think that we, we do think that, for example, uh, there's going to be vertical and lag resonances that are also going to contribute to dragging it in, to dragging orbits <laughs> into the disk. And so, but those are harder to treat. And um, so our, our, we have a number of undergraduates um, who are working on stuff. So a drag force treatment was much more straightforward. And so that's, that's kind of where we're starting from. Let me move this way. Do you have, did, did you guys have comments? Uh, yeah, so several issues, not directly related, but one thing is, uh, if the disk is clumpy or have spiral arms, which is actually very likely, especially during the star formation epoch, but even otherwise, then you might actually have an enhanced capture rate. People discuss this in a different context of stripping of stars by a disk, but this would be, this should work here too, so that's an interesting aspect to, to look at, but you can have enhanced rates. The other question I have is, when you have a binary, actually you see a picture of the binary going through a disk too, and uh, 
what happens to the bindings as they go to the disk, not when they're inside the disk? Can you have, uh, I don't know, tidal, uh, tidal stripping or tidal shock stripping, or can you excite eccentricities of these binaries? Can you help them merge even if they don't, are not captured in the disk? I think there are several interesting ideas that we can actually try and follow up. I had very similar comments like the, uh, with regarding to the binary so I don't wanna, um, I just have a question so so I still understand where they where the stellar mass black holes are coming from in this model yes so do they are they are they put on circular orbits to start out with or yes. okay so so you know it was very close to what Brian also said like you would expect that most of them are scattered in from very very far away so it will come on very highly centric orbits so the question would be uh, you know are you actually able to undergo such a strong you know Dissipation of energy during the first passes that you can like keep this as isolated this black hole problem or will you actually you know once you go out again you will start to random walk in angular mo uh, <coughs> m uh, momentum again such that these approximations break break down when the when the black hole is coming back again like it is probably being being scattered in right so when it's going out again it's not going going to be completely you know grind down that then. then scatterings will, will happen. And most of them will happen also in the outer parts, right, of the, of the disk. Yeah. Sorry, sir, regarding the uh, eccentricity introduction uh, upon a passing, so the uh, the change in the orbit per passing is, is relatively small, so I would not expect that to to be significant. We haven't looked at that specifically, but, but um, I would say because you have to pass many times to to grind down, it would. It, I, I, I wouldn't expect that to disrupt the binary. Of the of the unit, you mean the binary? Yeah, yeah. So if the effect per passing is small, then I wouldn't expect that to be a significant effect. Yeah, we haven't we haven't looked at it specifically, but because you have to go through many times, the differential effect on the two black holes should not be very large, right? So you're you're dealing with the time difference between the effects, essentially, right? And I would not expect it to be, we didn't look at it explicitly. So, so uh, okay. Um, we, we can take a look, actually, it's interesting. Um, yeah, maybe. I'll just use this opportunity. So actually, uh, it's very interesting uh, to hear about these track uh, <laughs> things because uh, as I presented yesterday, we are doing the same thing, but with the uh, old cluster. So uh, what I would like to comment here that uh, in our simulations, we had some stars which come in retrograde, passing the disk, and then they, each passing, they lose their angular momentum, and then they could flip up their orbit and become prograde. And so also in our paper in 2018, we show that, that there is for uh, the, the this drag force can lead to the formation of the stellar disk around the black hole so that there will be uh, 0.7 percent of the supermassive black hole mass could be contained in the stars around the disk forming so and uh, also we have this uh, kind of statistics probably i can look and at that with this different uh, stars coming in different uh, inclinations and different uh, eccentricities passing this accretion disk and then uh, th at some point they will come like they could be in very eccentric orbit passing the disk each time this will decrease their uh, semi-major axis and at some point this will be really grind down to the disk uh, disk plane and then it becomes exactly a circular orbit at the same time so from very eccentric orbit, which is inclined like 90 degree almost, it could come close enough and then flip uh, to lie down to the disk in a very short time, actually. Yeah, so you can, uh, we can talk about this if you are interested more. I'm glad you mentioned the mass of the disk because uh, actually I remember an old, a very old paper, 2005, by Kohlmeier and Miral Descude who even explained the M-sigma relation with yeah. capturing the stars in the disk. Yeah. So they actually built the edge. Um, I'm just trying to decide whether uh, the discussion is great, but this was, I think, slide three. <laughs> uh, 
Maybe so maybe <laughs> maybe big, big comments. Who? Yeah, I and, and then we'll move on to the, the last. We'll squeeze in one more slide, I think, yeah. before the break. Sorry, like, um, I have a beef with the 2KM uh, model. That kink there at 10 to the 4, it looks horribly unstable to edge mode. Have this have these models like being uh, being actually modeled with hydro to see what's happening there because I can uh, it, it imagine that there you will have things like uh, rossby wave in, in, in instability and forces and, and waves so so my, my impression is that you haven't actually used that this is for the Circo Goodman sure. model. Mm -hmm. Um, so. Yes, but we ha we do have results for the PQM, um, not um, necessarily. I was just going to say there's we did, you know there's not space on here, but we do have them, and they're not qualitatively different, although they are. No, I mean I don't want. But I guess he's asking for the physics of that sharp break. Yeah, and, uh, I just claim all also at, in the height. Ask Tom for water and Murray. This is, that so model I'm, was I'm put so together. Um, without thinking about these questions, they had different aims in mind. Yeah, sure. It's it's pretty clearly unphysical, and um, I mean, but nobody, to my knowledge, has done a proper hydro model yeah, of the accretion of gas from, say, uh, ten to the seven RG in, mm -hmm. um, and that. No, we didn't need to model the whole thing. So, I mean, like, model the transition. I, I believe that this part here is simply they they they. They concatenate the disk with an alpha disk with okay. the same M dot. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah. so you shouldn't take this too seriously. Yeah. Sure, but if you see there on the Z part, of, I mean, like the the um, the height, right? Yeah. If you model that with the actual hydro, that's not gonna be uh, uh, stable. I, I think we agree. Uh, well, anyways, yeah, I, I, I'm confused because I thought the Thompson Quadrant Murray model attaches really on to, into an alpha model. So I, I guess I have to dig into why there's this kink, but that's another issue. So I think the, the M dot, the M dot attaches. The M dot, M dot is fixed. M dot max, and you're saying that that leads to a, a kink in the surface. The opacity is different. So, Brian, you should make your last point, and then we move on to the slide. <laughs> my, 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 my other point some, is just a broader question, which is. Um, isn't there going to be a, I mean, if I look at this, these plots, uh, it suggests a very large fraction of all the stars are going to be dragged into this disk. Right. Um, at some point, that's got to become unstable. You can't just take all the stars in the nucleus and put them into the disk. Um, so what? what is, what's going on? Sorry, right, maybe I'll put up a whole new can of worms. <laughs> well, how does this thing self-regulate? What happens? Right, so that's that's an open question. That's an open no, question. Uh, Mike? Oh. Um. Uh, the boss wants to speak. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, you had your hand up. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I was just going to say, you know, where it's definitely ground down is at relatively small radii. So despite my having said, well, look, we know when it's at J star, right? When you look at the stellar densities and, you know, it's large, but it's not, if you, if, even if you grind in everything at 10 to the 3 or a few by 10 to the 3 or even, you know, out to 10 to the 4 RG, you know, you're not, you're not necessarily the, so for reasons, for reasons that uh, have a name who I'll, the shall remain nameless, um, the guilty shall remain nameless. <laughs> Um, we've got, we generally say the lifetime of an AGN disk is sort of one to a, a hundred million years. So, you know, that top dashed line is a little bit long probably by most, uh, you know, uh, that person is not a New Yorker, I'll just say. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's not that everything is going to get ground in. And this is also, again, only 45 degrees. So it's not, it's not all the angles. It's not... You know, the thing that gets grounded in the fastest is a red giant, which is, you know, a tiny fraction but of everything. If the stars get grounded to a disk, more than H over R of their mass, right, then the stellar disk will, will become gravitationally unstable. Yeah. So, so, so maybe you're right. It may not be all of them, but it may not have to be. 
right? So we need to think about what the implications are for um, observables, right? So the distinction between quasars and seiferts and liners and God knows what else you want to throw in there. Um, you know, which of those objects have more stars embedded in them, creating this turbulent, puffed up environment, which are, you know, this, this is one of the things that's going to constrain our models of AGN disks, right? Like, there, you're right, there has to be equilibrium for, for grind mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe that's one way AGN end. So, right. so I'm gonna, somebody has to leave, so we should squeeze in the last slide today uh, of the person who needs to leave. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The colors. There you go. Uh -huh. There you go. When do you have to leave? Now. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll take 10 minutes and then we'll have a break. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm working with uh, Savik and Barry and Amy Sikul in the back and a bunch of others in the NYC channel gang. And uh, go piggybacking off of what Saida does, as far as uh, what I'm doing, I'm looking at how a prograde or prograde <coughs> orbiters interact with retrograde orbiters in AGN disk. And so basically the approach was taking a prograde orbiter and giving it a 180 degree flip to its inclination angle. So similar to what she showed in her anim animation, uh, my body has 180 degrees added to it. So essentially it's now retrograde in comparison to the two prograde bodies and the retrograde, or excuse me, the prograde disk. So um, I have that plotted here on the left. And what you see is uh, some interaction around a thousand years and this is a uh, thank you this is this is the distance from the supermassive black hole in the center as a function of time and so as far as we know this is the first time anyone's actually plotted retrograde body in an agn disk which one is the retrograde the yellow excuse me so the yellow 23 solar mass line is uh represents the retrograde and the strategy was to actually to introduce the retrograde orbiter sandwiched in between a migration trap, which is around 700 AU, and two prograde orbiters. Because uh, work done within the group shows that retrograde bodies experience almost no torque forces. So the idea would be the prograde bodies would experience a negative torque towards the migration trap, basically forcing them to interact with the retrograde orbiter. And so what we see is the retrograde body gets flung out of disk and uh, the project's still hot, it's ongoing, so we're not sure why. So I'm trying to plot successfully the energies to see why it is that the retrograde orbit was flung out of the, the disk. But basically the motivation behind this is that if you look at, you know, Sagittarius A star to center of our own galaxy, uh, stars take on different inclination angles, different orbits and different directions. So it motivates the idea to see how these different orbited black holes interact with each other in different directions. And that's all she wrote. <laughs> Cue the music. Okay. Just to clarify for everybody, what are the assumptions that go into this model? What kind of code are you using? What's uh, what's going on? Why? Does, how does the migration trap actually show up in this model? So we're using the M-body code. So the disk is pretty much at steady state. Um, I know we have for sure a migration trap at around 700 AU. I believe that's it. Um, and the idea would be that the disk influences the motion of the bodies, and the bodies influence each other. But the disk itself doesn't actually react to the motion or the migration of the bodies within the disk. Yeah, sure. So um, these three bodies, I mean, I chose n to equal three for this instance, so it wouldn't be so computationally expensive just to see if it works. So work that Betsy Hernandez has done has shown that uh, retrograde orbiters experience no torque. So the idea would be to write in a statement that if the inclination angle of a body was 180 degrees to turn the torque off. And so I set its initial distance from supermassive black hole around 800 AU. And then the other two prograde bodies were a little bit further from the supermassive black hole at the center. And the idea, again, was to try and sandwich it in between so that two prograde bodies 
could migrate towards the migration trap and be forced to interact with the retrograde body. Correct. And in the migration forces acting on the prograde bodies, which are the red and green bodies from the disc. <laughs> Julian in the back has a question, comment. I, I guess it's a comment because it's a question, but I don't think anyone knows the answer. So what? So this retrograde um, black hole gets ejected after what a thousand years? Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering. So what? Gaia and Saida and also Beck had suggested with their grind down. Um, estimates is that a retrograde black hole gets like flipped an angle over into the prograde case and so who wins does it get ejected first or does it get flipped over first like what is going to actually happen to the retrograde uh, objects Barry has an opinion about that amazing <laughs> I'll do my own microphone running Yeah, so the, um, the picture that I have is that um, you have a nuclear star cluster around the SMBH. We magically add some gas. We don't know where it comes from or why it ends up there. But we end up with a disk with an aspect ratio. And so geometrically, some percentage of the nuclear star cluster are going to end up embedded in the gas disk just for free. And so roughly half of those should be on retrograde orbits just geometrically. Um, all of the objects that are then ground down, it seems that ground down efficiency is best for the prograde objects at relatively small inclination angles. So they'll end up ground down. So you're adding greater than, so, so you're increasing the prograde population up above 50% over, over time, right? Um, the retrograde guys find it much harder to get ground down into the disk. So essentially, you're just growing the asymmetry of prograde to retrograde over, over time. That's the, that's the naive picture I have. Can I ask about the coffee break? Or we have coffee is, yeah, we should have coffee. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I got some. Uh, <laughs> we, so maybe, we didn't notice. Yeah. So maybe one or, one or two more burning questions. Otherwise, we should take advantage of the coffee. <laughs> I would say one, one comment about okay. the retrograde yeah. stars. Yeah. So uh, I believe that if we would start with no disk and then forming disk with this uh, grinding, like flipping the orbits, then uh, it would be really, really hard to have stars in uh, circular orbit in retrograde direction in the disk. It does not really happen, actually, because usually stars come from outside to the disk. They drag it. Uh, and then uh, when they are coming in retrograde orbit, they are usually in very eccentric orbits. And then when they experience this drag force, they lose energy, but they cannot become circularized. But instead, they will try to flipping, and at the same time, they will shrink into the center. So they could really uh, accrete it before they could even flip out. So that, that also happens in our models, that stars in this ret retrograde orbits just capture it onto the black hole fast enough so the, the, the flipping time could not be reached. OK, I think we can stop and we can have more time after the coffee. So when is the co 11 o'clock? We come back at 11. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you going to the yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
our law in this particular hero, the radius, the radii in and out were different, so blah, blah, And I got a number of, like, she was equal to, like, 30. So the thing was that I, I realized after, like, when I was reading the so-called Hinden model and some other things that are subjects for, like, the distances are likely wrong. What do you think? Uh, okay. Okay, we will talk about later. I have to leave not so late, so. Um, but I'll see if I can. Right. Our, our entire disc is stable. Yeah, this is a 5AU, that's less than a car stack. Yeah, oh, it is. It's like, um, it's like half the disc. It's already, uh, it seems like really close to the, to the region that's like stable, but our entire disc is stable. So I don't know how to. Uh, uh, so the question is, what are the what are well, yeah, what are you? Yeah. Oh, you can choose the things. <laughs> yeah, but they have to be like, like they have to make sense. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they have to be. That's what it was. I was just like, yeah. I know, I know we can pick them, but I was like, I yeah. also want to pick something that actually. Like, yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. But I don't know how to. Yeah. Well, I mean, the units they are set, right? The units that you choose are what? Is the unit of distance? Yeah. The unit of speed. Yeah. That was set the unit of time. Right? This okay. group. Yeah, this group. And the unit of density is completely arbitrary. It doesn't change anything. No, 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 no. Yeah, as long as you are not caring about the, uh, the thermodynamics or, or the uh, or the subreactive of the yeah. unit of, of, of density is arbitrary. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I know. So you have to pick units that make sense. No, I know, but I don't. I also don't know how to like. So, do do I consider that the uh, mark is similar to like ten to the three? Like, I I want to make sure I do this conversion right. <laughs> but 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 I feel like it also depends on what mask you're using. They're, they're using RS and we have and they're they like us. They want to do the on the right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I, mean, I remember checking that potentially eight uh, solar masses, and then for the units that we're using for this frame, B, um, uh, uh, relativistic, I mean, the temperatures are like insanely high, and the orbital velocities are close to, to the speed of, of light. So, yeah, I mean, like, not too close, but like. Stuff that made me think that maybe then uh, uh, relativity would start playing a, a role. And, uh, yeah. So then I, yeah, but I, I did that with Joshua some time ago, some two years ago, to check what the units would be. And found that, yeah, potentially eight would be too. I wouldn't be comfortable with potentially eight. But Barry and Savik are going to have more. Formed opinions about the, 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 the things. I think I think they would do. Uh, uh, I think as I talked to Sarah, they actually really wanted to be that's very common. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But they're not like. So the thing is that, that we had discussed that it's not that it has to be oh, the entire thing. It could just be the inner portion, but like right. how far it is. Right. Like, because we also want to make sure that we have the right. 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 And we would model that. Right. Um, but that would also require me to switch to like, so you're right. So, it doesn't, yeah. so I, I don't assume that our thing is in the circle of humans, right? Yeah. Uh, I can pull the uh, I can pull the script that I did for checking the units with, with Joshua, and then I can. Uh, send a yeah, because yeah, because I don't I don't think it's on this slide. Like, 
So I, I, I just I think that's the one thing that I'm like that because we've been playing with it, I'm just like, oh, we have to do this. this. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing what happens when you do the with the units, right? Yeah, so yeah. When you show it, you need to convert it yeah. to actual comedy. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. yeah. Alright, thanks.
Did you teach? Yeah. Okay, welcome back. Uh, so we have actually three three more slides. I sneak my own slide in. Especially since Brian is here and we have the paper related to this topic. So we're going to bury and then Yuri and then uh, I have a quick slide and then we summarize and draw uh, conclusions. So uh, Barry, you want to go first? Oh, yeah. Um, so. Uh, hello? Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, in the spirit of um, Dan's slide yesterday, which I thought was an excellent question, what are AGN? It was a wonderful sort of um, discussion slide. Um, I sort of want to ask the room, what do we think embedded objects in AGN disks are going to look like? Right? So you have these, in the case of black holes, these tiny little things embedded in this vast sea of gas. Um, depending on your model, you know, they, they may be particularly thick or thin. Um, and they'll feed. Um, if they feed at a super Eddington rate, and I think this is a point that Yuri made uh, a while ago, um, you know, we could end up with a situation where we don't have much of a mini disk around these things. But then you can't feed super Eddington. Uh, yeah, well, can you get super Eddington with. Um, yeah, no, you need it. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'll 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 shut off. Yeah, that's true. Um, but what you will get is some sort of uh, temperature gradient inside the Hill sphere of the object, right? Um, and that could lead to some sort of convective flow. So you may have the irony of black holes looking like stars, essentially, inside um, the the AGN disk. Um, and then there's the separate question of black holes are the minority population in this disk. There are going to be lots of stars and neutron stars and God knows what else. Um, what are they going to look like? And what, ob what observable consequences should we anticipate from that? So for example, we may have supernovae going off. Are they going to be completely blanketed by the, the AGN disk, depending on the model that you assume? Um, what about white dwarf secreting? You'll have interesting binaries forming of various exotics. Um, what will happen to pulsars and neutron stars. Um, so I'm sort of introducing just the general discussion topic of what we think these objects in AGN disks should look like. Right. So Andrew had some gorgeous simulations yesterday. Is that actually what they're going to look like, or are we going to just be blanketing these things with so much gas that we can't really see that, that stuff? So I'll open it to the floor. Or Yuri. <laughs> yeah. I'm, tem I'm tempted to show my slide because it's making very similar points, but it's from our. Yeah. So I'm I mean, going to skip not. for a second. Yeah. And just to, <laughs> Yuri has the last word. <laughs> so to elaborate on the super Eddington part, this is from a paper that Nick Stone and Brian Metzger and I had uh, on this issue. And oops, what happened? This didn't come out too well. Uh, this is a model where uh, there is a stellar mass black hole uh, binary or single, doesn't really matter for this particular curve here. It's embedded in a disk, which is modeled with this Thomson quarter array model. And then you can calculate an accretion rate onto the black hole, uh, which is li limited either by the boundary rate or by the, by the tidal shear from the disk or the hill, the hill radius. And this here is the, the I don't, don't know what happened, but this is DMDT in Eddington units for the stellar mass black hole. This is in parsec from a 3 times 10 to 6 solar mass black hole. And this is 10 to the 4 here, at between 0.01 and 0.1 parsec. So if you simply ask the question, what's the accretion rate onto this compact object, it's 10 to the 4 times. It exceeds the Eddington rate out here at 10 parsec and then goes up to 10 to the 4 or 5 Eddington uh, further in. So it's huge. Uh, 
that's not. for an SMBH. I'm saying super Eddington off of the SMBH. Yes. Yeah. Super Eddington 40 for the stellar mass object. Wait, no, stellar mass object. How are you getting so much? This is for a super mass object. <laughs> no, this is for stellar mass. This is a stellar mass black hole embedded in an AGN disk. And the accretion oh, rate. So there's clearly some, some major thing that has to be resolved here because uh, this accretion rate is so high that it's starting to eat the entire supply to the supermassive black hole. But wait, how are you getting these extremely super Eddington rates when you're buried in an optical? Sorry, how are you getting these extremely high? Uh, super Eddington accretion rates when you're buried in an optically thick disk. Isn't wh why? Wh yeah. So I'm not. Sh I'm not sure it matters whether it's thick or optically thick or not. It's it's simply the you can think of it as a bond accretion capturing gas from either the bond disk, bond radius or the Hill radius. So you're capturing sure, gas and smaller. storing it in some hot. Corona, but that's self-limiting. Oh, uh, yeah, right. This is, just yes. the naive, yes. this is just the naive. If you just say, you know, this is my AGN disk. This is the density in the center. This right. is I have a black hole in it. Ah, uh, this is the non-feedback. The non-feedback. Yes. yes. Ah. This is just so saying less, that naively, if you do the naive thing. So that's exactly my point. That if you do this right. naively, it's not saying it actually necessarily. Right. Okay. But just to make it slightly less. Less cartoonish. Uh, this is a paper here which I like to look at. This is from 1999, I think, from Lubov in the context of planets. So this shows what happens. So, so as you, some of you probably know, because but those of you who haven't gone through this, there's the so-called gap opening criterion, and so the the standard naive picture is that when the stellar object is here, it's not opening a gap in the disk. The, the, the torques from the, the planet are too small to open a gap. Down here, the gap is opened. Now, there are many simulations, gazillions, of uh, planetary disks where the gap is opened. And this is a zoom in into the planet. So there's a, there's a the star here, in our case, supermassive black hole. This is the stellar mass black hole or planet. Uh, it's going around like this. And this is the flow of gas near the of, near this perturber. These are the so-called horseshoe orbits. They actually go around and then from the other side and they close. And then the way that this planet accretes is through shocks. So the, the, the stuff that's and this is roughly the heat radius. So anything in this annulus can be disturbed by the planet. And he's trying to go on these horseshoe orbits, and and a large fraction of the mass is actually going to end up going through a shock here, losing its angular momentum, and going to be captured. And if you look at this paper, it actually makes the same point that some good fraction, maybe a third of the accretion rate of the background disk in this regime, is actually captured by this planet. <clears throat> so you know. In our case, that's a bit crazy because uh, if you take an AGN and you're saying, well, I'm a little tiny guy out in the disk and I'm stealing a third of the supply, that's again 10 to the 5 times the income rate for the, the little guy. And then the question is, what happens? So. Yeah. I'm Thanks. So I have a question about this accretion in this case in which you have a stellar black hole inside the AGN disk. First, uh, how hot, you assume, is the disk there? You put a super hot disk, or what, what do you do with the temperature of the disk? And also, how you model the gas there? What type of polytropic <laughs> equation you use, or something like that? And I'm doing this question because there are some simulations in common envelope evolution that have shown that with different adiabatic index that will change the compressibility of the gas, you can or not or not form a disk around a thin particle. So in some cases, you will have super high accretion because you have the formation of a disk that allow the, the sinking of matter. And in other cases, you will have a super disordered system around the black hole and, or the 
same particle there, and you will not have this high accretion. So yeah. yeah I mean, I just yeah. So so the, so these enormous values come from taking the the naive you know mid-plane temperature and calculating the sound speed from that. Uh, for, and the, and the, this is you know. I mean, anyways, it's, 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 it's the usual equation of state with gas and radiation pressure and... Uh, it's the same model that was shown yeah. in the, yeah. the previous talk. Not the Sirker Goodman, but the Thomson Quarter okay. Marine so model. It's, it's, so it's quite cool on these scales, in, you know, in an average sense in the disk. But I think the, the big question is, is that likely to be <clears throat> the state of the gas in the immediate mm. vicinity? Because if you increase the sound speed from feedback, you're going to reduce the yeah. accretion rate. So, yeah. so this is just saying if you do the naive thing and take the average disk properties from this Thompson model in the mid-plane, what do they give you? But it's probably the feedback is very, very important. So, so okay. it, could, it could be significantly lower than this in principle, but you have to you have to specify what is that what is that feedback and how is it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the right figure. Yeah. Uh, according to the Dirkzinski et al. I think uh, the captured gas has uh, no rotation, almost. Yeah. But uh, I, th I think the gas is rotating in this picture. So what, what causes uh, the no? So uh, Andrea is sitting there. Maybe she can. Hi. What was the question? Uh, so the, the issue is that in our paper, the gas that's captured in the atmosphere it yeah. doesn't seem to have angular momentum, whereas, and so it's more like a cloud. Yeah, I was whereas just typing here, that out in my slide. For whereas me. here, the, the, there is some net rotation, net angular momentum, so you form a disk, mini disk. Well, I would say the difference is this is really poorly resolved. Um, I also don't know why there's a hole in the, in the middle, if they're assuming some really high mass removal rate. But if you were to sufficiently resolve the gas really close to the black hole, you would see uh, a huge pileup of gas there, actually. Um, as was uh, was mentioned, this is from the the nineties. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Nowadays, yeah. this is done much better. Mm -hmm. So I think the things to emphasize is, oops. Oh, my gosh. The thing has an answer. No, no, I, no, it's Andrea's answer. Oh, wow. okay. She sent me the slides. So oh, I'm sorry, oh. we're gonna look at the slides some more later. But I okay. figured, go ahead and put it up now. Just put it in there. Uh, yeah. Oh, I think. No, there it goes. You got it. Yeah. Um. <coughs> okay. Go on. Um. Andrea. Yeah, I was I was gonna bring this up after lunch. Um, yeah, I heard this might have come up you. yesterday when I took an unfortunate moment to step out of the room, sure. but. Uh, so these are simulations of an in spiral. But this is actually a 10 to the minus 3 mass ratio black hole binary. And I've zoomed in here just really close to the black hole. Um, this is in spiraling at the gravitational wave rate in an isothermal viscous disk in 2D. So it's a very simple simulation. Uh, and you can, the colors are a bit bad here, but you can see the streams that flow across the gap. And as Olten said, you have gas flow across the gap. Um, and you have this pile up of gas on the black hole. Here we assume some accretion rate that's related to the viscous time, but it's an approximation. Um, you still have this pile up of gas, really high density, and it has this asymmetry. So what I'm showing on the right is the torque density. Um, if you were to sum up all the values, you'd get a total torque. In this case, you have a positive torque on the back black hole. Uh, this actually occurs even if it's stationary, so it's not due to its movement. It actually just has to do with an asymmetry of gas within the Hill sphere. Um, so that's what I'm showing in the bottom, way zoomed in. It looks a little funky because of the contour function, but it is highly resolved. Um, and so this has to do with uh, basically the gas flow across the gap. Um, this is something we need to look more into, but either gas preferentially flows a bunch of the black hole or it spends more time there. So for whatever reason, you have this pile up that can essentially pull the black hole forward and exert a positive torque. And this is in addition to the torque you have from the spiral arms and the, um, the streams across the gap as well. I think we should definitely discuss the torques yeah. more tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. I think, this or this afternoon, the, the, the other 
feature now, that we're highlighting here is. Does this uh, have feedback? Oh, no. no. Okay. Yeah. The other feature that would we're highlighting is that it's. That unlike so it's a it's all, the 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 Lubov paper was also a 10 minus 3 mass ratio it was Jupiter, right. and the issue here is we're interested in the feedback, which has to do with how much angular momentum is the gas have when it falls here, and I think it is not clear. Uh, Plus we also know uh, from protoplanetary disk that, that this picture will change in 3D because. The accretion will happen more from the, the from the poles. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, from the uh, yeah, it would absolutely the change in three D. Yeah, and I still don't understand the, the positive part. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's so interesting that you see an asymmetry in the flow in front versus behind the black hole, and that might also occur in three D in in different directions. So the, uh, I should also say that if it's really spherical, almost. A cloud, and it's the, if the rate is 10 to the 4 times the Eddington, then it's actually a distinct possibility that the hole actually start eating all this gas because the radiation will be trapped. Mm. So the feedback will not actually happen. And that's also a bit bizarre because that means you put a stellar mass black hole into the disk, and then it quickly starts to grow to be a supermassive black hole. And then carbon so will be the radiation. Yes. An eight hour. So it'll be an it, uh, it's not an ADAF. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a flow where the diffusion time of photons outwards is longer than the free fall time inward. So it's an ADAF. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, sorry, I take that back. It's an ADAF, in, not in the usual regime of very low M dot. It's, right. it's a very high M dot, radiatively inefficient flow. But is it realistic that it's not going to have any angular momentum? I mean, it's, it's, you know, you're describing it as a spherical cloud. Uh, well, you I, I would cool. say no. Yeah, if you, if you can't cool, yeah. then you're spherical when you're accreting. It's like a galaxy cluster. Well, okay, you, but you have some. I mean, okay. you're not entirely. I'm confused. Why, why does cooling have to do with angular momentum? Because if you don't cool, then you can't get a thin disk. Well, not a thin disk, but it, right. you'll have some. some it's some non-spherical. So. So I, I don't think we I don't think we know this. The quick question, just to sharpen the question, is whether the uh, trapping radius is uh, inside or outside the centrifugal radius. So if the centrifugal radius is inside the trapping radius, then I think what I said is is possible. The the, the, the it will just be spherical flow where it eats eats the radiation. The radiation cannot diffuse out on the time scale where everything collapses. Uh, if the centrifugal radius is outside the trapping, then you can form a disk, and it could be uh, radiation can actually escape. And so uh, that could be measured in simulations. Uh, I don't think that's really clear at this point. I should emphasize that the angular momentum is determined by shocks, so it's extremely difficult for me to think of analytic arguments to predict this angular momentum because because it's determined by shocks that happen in this. <coughs> They're coming. If, if, if there's a small bit, like some kind of jet or something that comes out, <laughs> you know, then that's going to affect the temperature on the large scale, which in turn affects the the, the No of the jet body, without right? a disc. Why a disc without cooling? Yeah. No jet without a disc. Uh, gamma ray bursts increase uh, <laughs> very high uh, <laughs> and make jets. <laughs> uh, I think you you have rotation near the black hole. Yes, that, so that could be a tiny jet. So Starting from buried under this top. Uh, you know. Simulations show X jets even with the eight with when Can I say I don't we might wanna trade the microphone around again or I could yeah. just talk <laughs> but I just wanted to ask a clarifying question. I think it's related to Barry's question and the previous conversation and just very simply, maybe I just can't see on here. Uh, what is the scale height of this AGN disk compared to the hill radius of your guy? It depends on how far you out, are out in the disk. But um, when would you expect this AGN disk to be much thicker than the scale of the of your perturber? So I actually think it's about here. And that is uh, 0.01 few times 10 minus 2 parsec in this case. Okay, so we might expect that 
uh, black holes that are much closer in to not be obscured or embedded in some type of uh, cloud that you have reprocessing of radiation. But further out, it'd be a different scenario. It seems like two different regimes. I'm, uh, I'm not sure, because this is the scale height of the Adrian disk. And even here, where the, uh, the heat radius is larger than the scale height, and you open this gap, if you dump extremely high rates, it can just be a puffed up spherical yeah. object. So I'm not sure the scale height of the background is, is then the most relevant quantity. Yeah, and the TQM model, as you, as you go further in, it just puffs up. Um, so the innermost disk is much, it's, it's uh, a much larger aspect ratio um, than, than the outside. And around 1,000 gravitational radii in this model, you get this sort of uh, sharp drop in H over R. So there's a lot of, so what you think will happen is, is very much dependent on how you structure your, your AGN model, right? Yeah, right. So, okay, so I, I propose to move to the last slide. Uh, we need to allocate yeah, at least sure, yeah. a little time yeah. for discussion afterwards. So Yuri, you're... Um, okay, so um, uh, first of all, I want to mention a couple of papers that I wrote when I was a young man in uh, uh, early 2000s. And so um, they, there is significant overlap between them, and the first one is kind of more adventurous. So I will focus mostly, these dot points uh, are about uh, the first one. So the, the basic point is that uh, if you have HGN disk, um, uh, it's problematic. Uh, uh, it's problematic to keep it stable. Um, there are various solutions that have been proposed, but I think there is also observational evidence that maser disks uh, are gravitationally unstable at the scales of 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 parsecs. And in that case, it's RG, inevitable. So RG. In that case, it's inevitable that you have some star formation in the self-gravitating disks. This point was made uh, uh, prior to this work. But um, what I have argued is that if you look at characteristic mass scales of stars that may <coughs> form in this disk, uh, is that the stars will be quite massive. Uh, so this seems to be in agreement um, with uh, the stars that we see in the center of our galaxy around supermassive black hole, uh, which are orbiting black hole in this configuration, there is substantial evidence that the mass function is very top heavy in those configurations. Can so, you explain that actually, argument why is it top heavy? Um, um, so, uh, if you uh, look, um, well, this, the, the masses of the stars themselves are measured, so you know there is a range, and you can see that the slope of the IMF is very different from South Peter IMF and the center of the galaxy. But also, it seems that there is substantial dearth uh, of low mass stars of the same mass. This is because low mass stars are supposed to, um, when they're as young as uh, uh, as the massive stars in the center of our galaxy, they are supposed to produce a lot of X-rays from the coronae. And this is missing, you know. So Chandra has looked, and these X-rays are missing. So I think there is a substantial argument. This is the argument from the action in Sunyaev from 2005. There is a substantial argument that low mass stars of the same age are missing. So there is some evidence for top-heavy mass function. What's the theory, or uh, justification, or explanation? Well, I think the explanation is that if you just uh, determine some characteristic mass that you think uh, your fragmenting disk is likely to stop at, right? Which is something like, uh, uh, you know, isolation mass, or, you know, of that of that order. This turns out to be quite heavy, even for the disk in the galactic center, uh, a gaseous disk in the galactic center, which probably gave birth to these young stars. Uh, even for that disk, this this mass scale is quite big. Uh, so. Uh, 
it's it's a very different mode of star formation. You know, typically, stars form in fluffy molecular clouds with very low escape velocity. Uh, no escape velocity from a typical molecular cloud is of the order of like 10 kilometers per second. Is that right? Here we are talking about something which is really deep in gravitational potential. So the stellar winds don't blow the disk away, right? Now no feedback destroys the supplies of the accretion. It's very difficult if you put some object inside the AGN disk. It's very difficult to stop it from keeping to accrete further mass. Uh, so I think it's a very different, you know, the intuition for what the masses of these objects are are very different inside this AGN disks than they are inside molecular clouds. And like I said, observationally, it seems to be, you know, at least our galactic center is in support of this picture. Then if the disk persists, and this is a big if, if the disk persists um, um, uh, for longer uh, period of time, you know, if you assume that these disks live for like several, like 10 million years or whatever, then these massive stars have time to evolve and to, ex you know, uh, to form black holes. Uh, so these long-lived disks, you know, you expect them to be full of the stellar mass black holes. Um, and uh, these black holes accrete, certainly accrete uh, mass from the disk. And there are two cases that I have considered. One case is that if they accrete at Eddington luminosity and feedback onto the disk at Eddington luminosity, in that case, they don't make a significant difference uh, to the disk itself, HGN disk itself. The second case is, as, as Zoltan and Brian mentioned, if you allow for Bondi accretion, Bondi accretion is hugely super Eddington, you know, by orders of magnitude. And so uh, if you allow for, the, for a fraction of the supplied mass uh, to be ejected as, as feedback, uh, then the feedback will be very substantial and you can actually support HGN disk uh, you know, prevented from fragmentation. But this is a huge if, you know, if this happens. But I do think that the, the point that was made by Zoltan and Brian about super Eddington supply to the stellar mass black holes, this is a very valid point. Um, so the reason why I started all this is because I was interested in LISA. So these black holes, they migrate, like planets migrate through the disk and they merge with this central supermassive black hole. This is a very unusual uh, LISA source because presumably these disks, at least close to the black hole, they're in equatorial plane and they're circular. So this will be circular mergers in equatorial plane. First of all, they're extremely easy to model uh, as least a waveform. And second of all, uh, they're very different from all the other mergers' uh, signatures for stellar mass black holes or supermassive black holes. So this is a possible distinguishing feature. Um, and finally, so the point that was made uh, in this paper was that these black holes also have potential to open gaps in disks, especially in the inner parts of the disk. And so if you have 10 to the 7 solar mass black hole and 100 solar mass bla uh, uh, black hole coming in through the disk, or equivalently, if you have a million solar mass black hole and something like 10 solar mass black hole coming through the disk, it has you know, by, you know, formally by this gap opening criteria due to Lin and Papaloiso and others, it would open a gap in the inner disk. So then you have a potential that, you know, clearly this gap will have some, some impact on the observational appearance of the accretion flow. After the merger, this gap goes away, so the AGN changes look. Okay, that's kind of interesting. Also, in the context, and Zoltan and I have been discussing this a bit, you know, whether this could be made into some kind of picture for this changing look, AGNs and stuff like this. So this is, I think, you know, an interesting like phenological signature of this. Um, but okay, so there is a potential for optical counterpart for this type of merger. Now I have to say that I'm not sure about almost all of these points. You know, like I'm highly <laughs> uncertain, and um, so this is. Uh, you know, I think something that needs to be addressed with further numerical experiments. Um, I don't, I don't know. I think to me, of course, the most interesting thing is what Zoltan and uh, uh, Mordecai were mentioning is how the feedback really works. If you have super Eddington supply of material to a black hole, you know, what is the, what is the impact? 
the the last superadding term, the last LMS black holes in the universe which agreed at super Eddington rate. So my favorite example is SS433, which is an X-ray um, X-ray binary. It's a microquasar. It has been measured since early 80s. It has been monitored in many wave bands. Um, uh, by many, I mean X-rays, radio, optical, uh, gamma rays. You know, it's it's a hugely. Why are you pointing at something? Oh. So, Yuri, I, I have a question about the 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 Wait, open well, gap. Yes. Yeah. You want to pass the mic? Uh, Otherwise, Mordecai will be. I, I can go. Yeah. yeah. So. So if you if you have this open gap which is detectable uh, with with say optical means, uh, would it make sense to go through some archival archival data to see whether it happened in the past? Yeah, maybe. Um, no, I think uh, you know when I was when I was. I just want to say that when I was thinking about this, I was extremely naive. I thought the gap was between. But I think uh, simulations by Zoltan and Andy McFadden and by others have shown that the gaps are never clean. Um, right? So this, this gaps, uh, these gaps are probably not clean. So I don't think it will be like, you know, I was thinking of a very clean signature. That there is no accretion and suddenly AGN switches on. That clearly is not what's going to happen. But I think AGN can change look, and so Zoltan and I have been discussing about like possible uh, signature, observational signatures of it. I think it's an interesting, uh, uh, no, it's an interesting uh, line line of inquiry. But um, yeah. So I think I mean I I don't know if we were gonna put in a slide or anything on the observables. But so if if you have an emery disrupting the innermost disk, then you would expect a signature in, for example, the broad broad wings of the iron K alpha line. Um, and you because you're you're gonna be messing up the photons that are being upscattered and, and that sort of thing. Um, and depending on the, uh, but the, the SED is not going to change very much except in the U, in like the rest UV. So the changing look quasars, right? If you, even if you take like a pretty naive um, setup and you just yank out uh, the innermost few RG of gas, um, which I know, you know, Sultan and, and Andrew have shown that that's probably not right anyway. Um, it doesn't show up that much in the optical. It shows up only really in the in the ultraviolet because most of the light at the longer wavelengths is is, is not coming from that really small area there. So I think it does make the case for maintaining our ultraviolet observational capabilities, especially in conjunction with LISA. Um, and so that's that's certainly something. Yeah. Well, but can you do it before LISA? Do you need LISA for this? If you so, just monitor a large number of sources? In in the in the optical it's really um, in the optical it's really hard to find this thing. But the, the X ray signatures you can search for now with XMM if they're coarse. Um, um, I mean Athena will get us exquisite coverage of 30 broad iron K alpha lines from nearby AGN, three zero. That is not enough to do, you know, serious constraints. Well, it's enough to do serious constraints on 30 nearby AGN, but it's not a good statistical sample. You can also play with soft x-ray features, which might show wobbles or dips and things. And so you might be able to get your sample up to maybe 100, 150 in the nearby universe, but it's going to be much smaller than the um, the LIGO and LISA search volume. But I mean, we'll, we can talk more about this on the on the observables session. Uh, also, <laughs> I mean, if you're removing the innermost regions, 
you're probably going to disrupt the x-ray corona. So you probably don't even need to look for detailed signatures in just the iron K line. You'll probably see just a very dramatic change yeah, in the x-ray flux. So yeah. missions like Erosita, even that's right. monitoring, you know, many, many AGN could find these kinds of signatures. Or even X-Men right now that has yeah. covered, right? You, you look for this rapid change, yeah. yeah. Oh, right. Also, uh, how many gaps are we talking about, uh, right, Yuri? I think if you just um, mentioned the uh, um, Sagittarius Star as an example, right? You have multiple of these massive stars, so you should have possibly a large number of these gaps opening up at the same time, right? Wouldn't that have a different effect observationally? Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> Um, how how many how many gaps? I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think. Um, <coughs> oh, that, well, and, so I'm just gonna something slightly different. Oh. Uh, yeah. So let's if, let's leave 15 minutes for for our figuring out everything yeah. we need to do. Okay, my very last point is all of this presupposes that there is no migration trap in the AGN disk which holds things up so that they actually end up accreting. And a migration trap comes from a change in the, f fundamentally basically a change in the density gradient. And we might very much expect such a thing uh, in a generic disk, in a generic AGN disk model. And so you can hold things up at the migration trap and the gravitational wave decay time scale from there is longer than the AGN disk lifetime. So it's not it's not necessarily always the case it's gonna happen. Okay, so that's just something that uh, something else that I want to talk about. Um, okay, so that's something else we'll, we'll have two more last questions. Definitely on the I just thought if you have a well, little black holes in the migration trap, they're wait, going to Mike, merge. Mike, Mike, Mordecai will be very angry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I just figured if you have black holes in your migration trap, then they're you know, presumably going to merge and then eventually grow and then carve gaps, in which case the theory for the migration trap would change That's right. Correct. and they would likely migrate inward or outward. Okay. That's right. so. okay. You already lost. Uh, I was on Kim, uh, put the last one uh, again that was um, showing the um, the negative friction. Yeah, that's that's what I want to talk about. Oh, yeah. oh, I was going to ask uh, about that. Oh, well, well, thank you, well, thank you, thank you for asking. So this is <laughs> this is one of the points is that I said that I'm not sure about any of, almost any of these dotted points, in particular this migration thing. I'm not sure about uh, because typical planetary migrations are studied without feedback onto the onto the disk. Um, now. Changed. That has changed. So there are, there are the pioneering papers by Frederick Massé and his collaborators in, in uh, Mexico, which show that if you have a very hot planetesimal inside uh, uh, inside the uh, the disk, you no, know, it alters the structure of the gas flow around itself, so that the torque can change sign. Okay. So uh, with Andrei Gruzinov, um, uh, actually, I'm writing a paper uh, right now where we also propose that this can happen as a result of super Eddington uh, accretion onto stellar mass black holes. So this cartoon that I show, um, so there are two cartoons. One cartoon is a bondi coil accretion, which is basically black hole moving through a dense gaseous medium, right? So the gas, this is in the frame of reference of the uh, black hole. The gas comes from the left. It goes through a very weak bow shock. Don't worry about that. And then it forms through another sh strong shock and over density, a tail behind the black hole. Okay, this tail is going to pull back onto the black hole. So this is the conventional dynamical friction. Now, if you imagine that black hole is a super Eddington accretor like SS433, 
SS433 basically ejects as wind almost everything, you know, more than 99% of the mass that is supplied to SS433 is ejected as a super Eddington wind. Uh, this wind, you know, if you imagine this wind, how it back reacts onto the oncoming gas, it will create a very strong bow shock. And for some parameter range, this bow shock will push beyond the Bondi radius of the black hole itself, okay? We have also multiple examples where black holes punch beyond their Bondi radii uh, for black holes in centers of galaxy. If the shock goes beyond the Bondi radius, uh, then you can see that instead of an over-density behind the black hole, you have an under-density. So you have the dense gas ahead of the black hole and an under-density behind the black hole. In that case, the gravitational pull will be in the opposite direction and the black hole accelerates. Okay, so the dynamical friction in, the, in this case is in the opposite direction. No trapping, no grinding down, no orbital migration within the disk. Okay, so this is just like something that may happen in real life, which is different from, you know, some conceptual uh, first pictures that, uh, you know, people like myself or others have drawn. Yes. So what term, in, does it just accelerate forever to the speed of light? Or sure. <laughs> does it stop? Does it, how does this stop? Um, because I know how it stops this one, it just slows down to the ball flow. Yeah. This one is going to just accelerate to... <laughs> to move outward. But, well, but, yeah. but, 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 how do you feed it? You, you've just driven away all the gas that's feeding your so, wind. So, so, so look at SS433. SS433 is fed. Okay, so it's fed through the Roche lobe overflow. And yet, uh, everything that is fed to SS433 is ejected as, as a wind. The wind, by the way, in SS433 is extremely well measured. This is because the disk uh, around the black hole is processing, right? So your line of sight is probing a range of inclination angles through this disk. And for each of the inclination angles, you're measuring the speed of the wind. You know, you have exquisite optical data for this. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I take your point, Mordecai, this is... Uh, uh, but SS433 has a donor sitting right there. As a donor, right. So here the donor is the disk, the AGN disk itself. But you're driving that away with your bow shot. Well... That's it is contradictory. So, so you can have, you know, wind in one part. Okay, the wind doesn't have to be spherical, right? You can, the wind can be in one part, uh, you know, going out and where the wind is not there, the still give you the one. So this is uncertain for precisely the same reason as you're saying, you know, this is, you know, Grudinov and I are theorists, we don't do simulations. Um, but, you know, conceptually, you can imagine that some, uh, you know, there, some stream comes to the black hole, fits at a high rate, and the outflow is in the direction which is, you know, perpendicular to the stream. Uh, so the geometry of this obviously has to be worked out. So I'm not giving it as a, you know, if I if I had a positive, yeah, if I had the positive, definite opinion that this is what happens, you know, I would tell you so. I think this is a possibility that needs to be explored. I should say I have seen a simulation recently. Tamara Bogdanovich at Georgia Tech. I don't know if you've seen. I don't think they're talking about winds. They're just talking about photoionization, and they. So that's a simulation. And they made similar points that the wake is. Erased. Yeah, but sorry, but in that case, they generate the bow chalk, and you have this positive or negative dynamical free chalk that is. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, yes, in that paper of Park and Bolanovich, they simulate this with radiation, only no winds, and they generate this, they change this, they have this under density behind the black hole, but then the, dynamical fr the negative dynamical friction is super low. It's like uh, four order of magnitude is smaller than the actual dynamical friction. So at the end, it's like you're stopping the dynamical friction, but you are not accelerating the black hole at the end. You're only stopping the dynamical friction. And that is for a, a place in which you assume that radiation can escape and ionize the medium. So it's optically thin to the radiation of accretion of the black hole. So my intuition is that much stronger effect is mechanical wind, or the wind. 
sorry, that my intuition is with Super Reddington and accretion, radiation is not important. It's mechanical energy of the outflowing wind, which is playing the key role. And this is, in fact, what happens in Super Reddington sources, which are observed for stellar mass black holes in the galaxy. Yeah. All right. Uh, all right. Thank you for all the one slides. And let's go back to this list. I actually think we did a pretty good job of uh, answering or touching on most of these. Um, I think actually the instructions are that we should figure out what needs to be done next to solve all these problems. So uh, again, the floor is open. Do you want to build a new telescope? To measure something? Do you want to build a big computer uh, to calculate something better? Uh, Sounds like uh, we need to answer Yuri's question first, right? Is it working? Because I do feel where this is very fascinating topic. I'm looking forward to the next 10 years because we're at cartoon level, I think, for most of yeah. this stuff. So my inclination is to say we actually need a lot more theoretical understanding. Brian. I was just wondering, I mean, you've done this work with Yohei Yonoshi on super Eddington accretion and feedback on large scales. I mean, do you think that that is relevant here? I mean, it sounds like it's a very... Thank you for asking. Uh, <laughs> it is true that in that paper, we have a result, which is that if you reach these extremely, we call them hyper Eddington rates, then uh, there is no radiation coming out, and everything is followed. Uh, so I think you, actually that is my statement that you can actually steal most of the gas by the stellar mass object and swallow everything if you believe that paper we have with Kohei. I should just explain that that paper is a point mass secretor. It's basically the bondy accretion problem plus radiation. And what happens is if you see the Eddington lake rate m dot by a factor of 10, but not by a factor of 10 to the 4, then you actually do shut down the flow because you make an H2 region which goes after the bond radius and shuts down the flow. And then it's, it goes through cycles. And the time average rate is always at the electron. So this is spherically symmetric? Right? Spherically symmetric. Again, it's between a cartoon and a real simulation. Because it's a, it's a it is a simulation, but it's spherically symmetric. But the main result is that you cannot have super Eddington accretion. Radiation prevents it, unless m dot is like kind of three, four times Eddington, and then it just swallows everything. Because the radiation feedback never propagates up to the bonding radius. It's so, the material is so dense that you just can't prevent the inf inflow. So there's no super, but there's hyper Eddington in that picture. So may I propose on the theory side doing that Calculation with rotation. <laughs> yes, uh, in fact, Kohei is kind of doing that yeah. in, in 2D with rotation. But I think, uh, yeah, let's talk more broadly what needs to be done. Um, no, sorry. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I think we still need to say what's a reasonable AGM <coughs> disk model. I think that's sort of a, a big issue, right? Um, and to the extent that even if we, so if we had an AGM disk model that everybody believed uh, and that we could explain all the different uh, luminosity variations of AGN disks, quasars, Seifert's, liners, etc. Um, <clears throat> uh, we still might have to think about. We know, for example, that in AGN disks there are winds that come off, and there are large gas clouds with um, potentially interesting densities um, for altering dynamics of objects in the 
in the central nucleus. So um, I don't, uh, yeah, so that, that would be something that I think it would be good if we could do a better job there. Yeah, so this is very scary because that has nothing to do with us in this room, right? That's just how our quasars are fueled. And I agree, I agree we need to understand that, but how, how are we going to do that? Even that, that's an old problem. Yeah. I mean, it's not specific to the binary. That's true. It's not specific to this workshop where we try to put binaries in the disk. That's true. It's just any disk. That's true. So that's a long standing issue, and uh, maybe yeah. somebody can comment on how we can solve that. I, yeah, I was I, I was just going to ask that, along with along with developing more sophisticated models of AGN disks um, that we can agree on, um, I think the the simulation program is quite difficult, right? Because you need radiative feedback and 3D and shear. And I've talked to Andrew about. It. I don't think Andrew's here, but um, he almost cried when I asked for that. So this is a very hard problem. Um, so the, the simulation path is, is difficult, I think. Um, it may be easier for some of us in this room to tackle the, the AGN disk model problem, I think. I'd actually like to go back into the binary formation. Our main issue, if we want to have gravitational wave sources, for example, is to get the binaries together. The problem is that we have far more main sequence stars than black holes. Which means that if you assume that the binaries are formed in the disk and not captured as binaries, you will always form black hole main sequence binary far, far faster than you ever form a binary black hole. And when you, then you want to actually you know, exchange it with a black hole, I can understand it, but you're more likely to actually have a collision with the main sequence stars and these kind of things much before you have the binary black hole mergers. So, my expectation is that you're actually going to significantly quench any gravitational wave measures. You might actually have domus extra binaries and interaction with stars, I know, microtile disruption events, these kind of things, but far less gravitational wave sources. And I think we need to, to think about it if we think the binaries are formed in the disk itself. But are you basing this on in spiral time scale of uh, binaries? No, just the frequency of black holes versus the frequency of main sequence stars. For any black hole, black hole encounter, you have far more black hole main sequence encounters that can produce the binaries. So, just frequencies. So, the black holes will migrate more quickly than all but the most massive main sequence stars, and therefore will pile up in the migration trap where they will have opportunities to encounter other black holes at an enhanced rate. Now, whether that's sufficient, It, it goes through all the all the disks and you see all the stars in between. So, yeah. and even if they have a bit of extra over extra yeah. over the main sequence stars, it's mm. not so much faster. Okay, the differences in masses is not that huge. So, so I would I would add to Haggai's point. It depends on the hardening time scale for the black hole main sequence binary, right? Uh, versus the tertiary encounter time and, and what happens. So it depends how many objects we think are in the disk and what happens to those complicated dynamics when they right, encounter each other. Brian? Yeah. Yeah. Since we're talking about what, uh, this, is just a, this is just a general point that, you know, as Haggai was saying, there's a lots of other things that happen in galactic nuclei that are going to be probes of all this physics we're talking about. There. Yeah. Things people think may be tidal disruption events. Some people have question question that there are other things be predicted micro TDs. Um, so I think one of the things is that you know, in traditionally time domain surveys avoid galactic nuclei because they're trying to find supernova, and they want it's like a contaminant for them. Like you know, there's all types of, of problems in galactic nuclei. They're hard to you know, <laughs> detect the transient because it's already bright in that part of the galaxy, etc. So I think. You know, if, if we're really interested in galactic nuclei transients, maybe there's a way to design a survey or, or you know, that would, that would focus on that. Hey, guys, there's something to say. But that, that would be my broader point is that, is that it's, right now it's sort of an afterthought of, of, I would say, most time domain surveys. But if we want to really, you know, figure out what's going on, maybe we need to be more uniformly monitoring. Well, sorry, before we go to Well, that's one of the reasons I'm actually here. I'm, 
uh, at JPL, I mean, that's what we do is missions. And one of the things that I'm trying to push for is a dedicated mission that will monitor AGN. And any of these things that I think are developing as, and I was going to do this tomorrow for the electromagnetic components of this, is that, you know, obviously an eye towards what are the uh, emission mechanisms that is, what are, or what are the consequences for uh, the wavelengths that we're talking about. But I don't think we can do this very much like you said without a dedicated mission. If we're trying to piggyback on other things, we can get a lot of information. But I, my sense of it is that even a small sat, which is dedicated to looking at 20, 30, 100, however many numbers that we come up with that are necessary to monitor, that that's the only way that we can do it. You have to just do this. You'll get a lot of other things because monitoring and time domain are great and it will give you a lot of other stuff and it will give you a lot of other AGN science. But I think that we really have, my sense of it is that the only way we can do this is with a dedicated space mission. So we're officially 12, but I think we can go a few more minutes. I just should mention that we actually have this service because of the interest in tidal disruption events. Uh, over the last years, many of the servers now start looking on that luminary, which they didn't do before. Better, yeah. So we actually get, get it for free, in a sense, from the TDE community, to some extent. Yeah, I was two things sort of going back a little bit. One thing that when I said, I think we need better AGN models, and people were like, okay, not our department. Um, maybe a uh, fairer that's, that's question. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, sorry. no, I know, but you know, but maybe a fairer ask, I think, or let me see if this is, um, if people would agree that this is enough information. So I think that what we would like to know before we start dropping things in to perturb the disk is, do we know what the density of gas is going to be as a function of radius? Do we know what the aspect ratio is going to be as a function of radius? And do we have a sense of the lifetime? Like, are, are those things that we can do a better job of? Like, we don't have zero constraints on those right now. But I'm wondering, is there anything that we can do to get better constraints on those? Or are there other parameters of AGN disks that we also need besides those just to start with. So, I see Andrea in the back. But maybe in the afternoon, this will be coming up again. But I think if you want to make an outrageous answer, it's you can use LISA to study directly the migration rates, for the impact of the gas on the waveforms by LISA. Can talk uh, about that tomorrow. It's a little hilarious to, let's not want to build visa, but and I'm going to, I think you'll explain this this afternoon. Yeah. Actually, I think silence is okay because we're, the food is out. So no punchlines, but lots of interesting questions. And uh, one request for a space mission. <laughs> so thanks everybody. Uh, see you at what time? Yeah, one thirty. Yeah, thank you.